Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. In their new book, The Real World of College, What Higher Education Is and What It Can Be, Howard Gardner and Wendy Fishman analyzed more than 2,000 interviews with students, faculty, parents, alumni, and administrators from a variety of colleges and universities to examine why students consider learning secondary to their resumes, job prospects, and earning potential. The authors argue that higher education in the US has lost sight of its principal reason for existing and offer recommendations for how every college can become a community of learners who are open to change as thinkers, citizens, and human beings. Howard Gardner is the Hobbes Research Professor of Cognition and Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And he is the author of 30 books, I'm pretty sure that's right, including, including A Synthesizing Mind, Multiple Intelligences, Multiple Intelligences, Frames of Mind, The App Generation, and Responsibility at Work. Gardner is the recipient of MacArthur and Guggenheim Fellowships, honorary degrees from 31 colleges and universities, and the Brock International Prize in Education. Wendy Fishman is a project director at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and she has written about development and learning for various scholarly and popular periodicals. She is the lead author of Making Good, How Young People Cope with Moral Dilemmas at Work, co-developed a classroom curriculum for teachers and students, and has consulted on school reforms. Wendy, Howard, thank you for joining us. The screen is yours. Thank you, Andy. Good evening, everyone. I trust that I'm audible. Very pleased to be here with Wendy this evening. And uh, I'm speaking from my home in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but I am a Pennsylvanian by birth. In fact, uh, I come from Scranton, as does President Biden, and we are even age mates. As a young person growing up in Northeastern Pennsylvania, I made frequent trips to Philadelphia, to athletic events, to cultural sites, and even, if memory serves, a few dates. More recently, as a member of the American Philosophical Society, uh, I have come frequently to Philadelphia and may even have met and spoken to some of you. But this evening, uh, as Andy said, we're going to talk with you about a book we've written and an ambitious study that we've carried out. Wendy, who is the senior author of the book, and I um, are researchers at an organization called Project Zero at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I've been there for well over half a century, and though she doesn't look at Wendy's been there for over a quarter of a century. We've worked together on many research projects and collaborated in publications in many topics, and I think we're still on good terms, which is my, I'm the victor there. Um, most relevant to the current collaboration is a book that Wendy was the senior author of, of many years ago called Making Good, How Young People Cope with Moral Dilemmas at Work. We may come back to this book later this evening, um, but in the study that that book describes, we were very, very concerned about the attitudes of young Americans to ethical issues. They knew what ethical issues were. They um, thought that one ought to be ethical, but they said that's for later. When we've grown up and are successful, then we'll be ethical, but for now we want a pass. And we didn't like that result. And so we began to work with college students at a few schools in New England. And we held reflection sessions with students to get them to um, confront various kinds of ethical dilemmas. And as we had did these uh, sessions at various schools, uh, our curiosity deepened, and we really wanted to understand in much greater depth what was going on with college students in America in the 21st century. And so we decided to do a big study. And of course, if we had found the answer in the existing literature, we wouldn't have had to do the study. But even though there are books that come out all the time, about college, and some of them are worth reading. Um, they're by and large based on experiences in one or two colleges with one constituencies, small samples, and even just the authors 
prides and prejudices. So ultimately, working with two dozen researchers and a gaggle of foundation grants, we decided to find out. And the result is the book, The Real World of College, which has not yet been published, but within a few days it will be. And uh, this is actually the first public event in which we can speak with you um, about a book that actually exists, the, the, the Real World of College. So Wendy will tell you what we did, what we found out, what we think it means, and then I will join her afterwards to share the Q&A. All yours, Wendy. Okay. I'm just going to attempt to share my screen. Okay. And Howard, because I can see you, I, can you see the, the slides? I can, but I'm going to stop my video if I can. Okay. No, that's okay. Great. Well, thank you for having us and welcome everybody. Um, today, Howard and I are eager to share some of our headlines with you from our 10 year national study of higher education. As Howard mentioned, our goal was to collect in depth qualitative data in which we could listen very carefully to what individuals said and what they didn't say. In fact, the omissions are just as important sometimes as what people do actually say. And as he said, now after five years of collecting data and nearly three years of analysis and two years of writing, our book, The Real World of College is due out next week. We parse the book in four different ways. What we did, what we found, what we think it means, and finally, our own personal views, given our research background and our educational experiences. So our plan for the next 30 minutes is to take you through some of our major findings, and then we are thrilled to have a rich discussion with you afterwards. But first, before we get, begin, I'd like for you in, on Zoom to take the role of a participant in our research, to put on your hat of maybe a parent of a college student, a faculty member, an administrator, perhaps even a college student. And I'd like you to consider a question we asked of all 2000 participants in our study. If you could give one book to a graduating college student, what would that book be and why? While we gave participants several minutes for this question and talked with them about their responses. I'm gonna ask you to take 30 seconds at most to think, and if you're willing to write in the chat, the name of the book, and maybe just a phrase or a few words or a brief sentence about why you would recommend that book. So while you're finishing up, you might even predict as a researcher now, what others on Zoom might say, what today's college students might say, what faculty might say or trustees might say. We're going to return to this question later on in the presentation. So first, some brief background on what we did. Our data collection involved one hour in-depth interviews with 2000 participants representing the major constituencies across 10 different campuses in the US, in the United States. You'll see those campuses on the bottom of the screen. The people that we interviewed included 1000 students, incoming or freshman students and graduating students. 500 faculty and administrators, 500 parents, young alums, trustees, and also some job recruiters. As you can see, the institutions represent a range of colleges and universities in the United States. They are located in different geographical areas. They represent different categories of selectivity. Some are small, like only have 1,600 students. Others are big. Um, and they'd have 20,000 students, some are residentials, others are commuter campuses. At all of these campuses except one, we interviewed individuals connected with the liberal arts and sciences program of each campus. We were really interested in schools that did not focus on a particular vocation. Our 10th school, Olin College of Engineering, was our comparison school. 
The interviews took a lot of time. We traveled to campuses, met with faculty and administrators and trustees in their offices. We took notes and transcribed every interview. And once our data was collected, we began to analyze really in earnest over 250,000 responses to 40 different questions. That book question was one of our questions. That's 11 million words across 2000 interviewees. And as careful researchers, we analyzed the data by categorizing and coding each interview and also ensuring reliability across researchers and coders so that no interpretation was left to just one individual. Our coding and analysis was targeted to particular questions and also to holistic concepts that could only be determined across an entire interview. So here's an important finding to keep in mind throughout the rest of the presentation. Across schools, we find that students are much more alike than they are different. I don't think we would have predicted this at the beginning of our study. We might have thought that students, for example, who go to a more selective school might talk differently than students who go to a less selective school, or they might talk differently about their goals for college. They might use different words to describe these goals, or that students who go to small residential colleges might be different than those students who go to big, large schools with lots of options. And we found this wasn't the case. And here's some evidence in terms of words. As you can see on the left side of your screen, these are 50 of the 100 most common words across students that we heard. And you'll see for every word, I know that it's quite small, but for every word, there's 10 strands representing the 10 different schools, 10 different colors for how frequent this word was for the students on that particular campus. And you'll notice that the colors for each word, the different strands, clump together. In some cases, you might see a, a strand on its own, but in general, they clump together. And this shows that in general, across schools, students use the same words with the same frequency. Some of these words are words like class or professor or books, but some of these words surprised us. Words like mom and help. And one word, about help. While we thought that students would be talking about the help that they give others, they actually were more focused on describing the help they needed. We're going to get back to that at the towards the end of the presentation. On the right hand side of the screen, just more evidence that students use similar words across the interview. This is one question we ask students at the very beginning to do in one adjective to describe other students at their school. And you'll see for the 10 different schools that the word diverse was used quite a bit at five different schools. And at two of those schools, the word was quirky, which is another way of saying diverse. So just another uh, way of showing you that students across schools use similar words. So four questions um, that's going to guide the rest of this presentation. Um, first, why is it important to go to college? The second question we're going to respond to in this presentation is what can students get from a quality higher education? Third, what are obstacles that stand in the way of higher learning? And fourth, how can we improve the college experience for everyone? So first, why is it important to go to college? In our data, we just discern what we call four mental models of college, how people think about college, its importance, and how they approach the experience. Here are the four different mental models. First, inertial. College is just the next step after high school. There's lack of clarity about what college is for. I just go because it's the next step. That's what inertial is. The second mental model is transactional. Students talk about college as a way to earn degrees, build resumes, get into graduate school, network with others that will be helpful for future jobs. The third mental model that we find is college is an opportunity to investigate lots of different fields, disciplines, marinate new ideas and new activities and meet new people. This is the exploratory mental model. 
On the fourth mental model is what we call transformational mental model. That is, the purpose of college is to reflect about and question one's own values and beliefs with the expectation and the aspiration that you might actually change in some fundamental ways over the course of college. Importantly, we don't ask students to identify their own mental models. This is a holistic concept that we code for after reading and analyzing an entire interview. Therefore, in response to different questions, we begin to understand how students view college. And as coders, we make decisions about what their mental model is. So now I'm gonna show you some findings about mental models across students. Here, you'll see that most students or the majority of students are transactional. Fewer students are exploratory and even fewer are transformational, less than 20%. Happily, even fewer are inertial. Interestingly, we find few differences across students at schools. We don't find any difference in, across gender. We don't find any student differences across students with different majors. That's the hard sciences versus humanities versus social sciences. We find no difference. And we find no difference really with respect to where students even went to high school or where they grew up. Perhaps the most interesting difference is that sometimes we find that students at the different colleges explain different purposes for the transactional mental model. So sometimes students at the less selective schools tell us that they need to focus on the degree and the job in order to be able to transform, to become a different person, change the course of their life and their family's life. We call this transactional to be transformational. It's a blended mental model in some ways. This is very different than the transactional mental models expressed by students at the more selective schools, which often describe college as a way to get to the best law firm, medical school, or finance job. In general, though our data are not longitudinal, we do find that over the course of college, when we compare our group of first year students to our group of graduating students, that the percentage of transactional mental model students stays about the same, but the percentage of students exhibiting a transformational mental model actually does increase. This is a promising sign for higher education. And here's what we find when we compare mental models across constituencies. You'll see here on this slide that students are represented by the blue bar on campus, that's faculty and administrators, are represented by the green bar. And off campus, adults, that's parents, young alums, and trustees, are represented by the yellow bar. Look and see the transformational mental model. Nearly 80% of faculty and administrators, that's the green bar, express a transformational mental model. And look at how few students, that's the blue bar, represent that same mental model. And you'll notice the same misalignment when you look at the transactional mental model. The blue bar of students and the yellow bar of off-campus adults are much more similar for that mental model than the green bar of faculty and administrators. In fact, across our study, not just with mental models, we do find that students and their parents and young alums and sometimes trustees are often more on the same page than students with the faculty and administrators, those adults that they hopefully see on a daily basis. So the second question, what can students get from a quality higher education? While it's difficult and maybe nearly impossible to demonstrate all the effects of college, we believe that we can measure and show intellectual development of the mind over the course of college. We created a measure called Higher, Educational, Higher Education Capital, HEDCAP for short, which is the ability to attend, analyze, reflect, and communicate on issues of importance. To make this vivid, Let's think about somebody that you might sit on, sit next to on a train or a bus. If you're talking about, for example, a book, 
maybe the one that you recommended at the beginning of this presentation. You might talk about the context of the book, why the book is different from other books, what the characters reveal in the book, how the plot of the book might be different than a movie. You might notice how your seatmate asks you questions, asks you about other books that you read, and asks you about series of books. This is essentially what we did when we talked with students and all the adults about higher education. We talked with them and had a far ranging, wide ranging conversation about college. And we were able to determine how they were carried out a conversation, how they connected the dots, how they considered other perspectives, how they expressed their views and made an argument for something and asked good questions. We used a very simple scale, one to three, to determine each student's head cap. We also did score young alums. One was for little to no head cap, two was for some head cap, and three was for a lot of head cap. Importantly, we can't prove that, head, that people don't have any head cap, so our scoring starts at one and not zero. We coded or scored head cap in two different ways. First, we de-identified all the transcripts and what we call blind coded of participants' responses to seven different questions in our interview. This is important because in this coding of seven different responses to questions, we didn't know the school a student was at or their stage, whether they were a first year student or a graduating student. Secondly, we gave an overall score for an entire transcript. This approach allowed us to step back and look at the overall picture and not just base higher, educa higher education capital on one particular response to a particular question. So for example, back to the book question that I asked you at the beginning of the presentation, that was one of the seven questions that we scored blind. We did not score the title of the book. We scored the explanation for why the book would be given. This was important because we also scored whether a student would ask things like, can I give a series of books? Or could I give a book without any explanation? Sometimes a children's book would receive a high score because of the rationale, while other books like Moby Dick might receive a very low score if there was no rationale. So when we look across all students, we find a typical bell curve where the highest percentage of students are in the middle, score two, and fewer students exhibit a score of one or a score of three. In many ways, this is not surprising. It is what we would expect from a three-point scoring system. That's why we like to compare our results, which I'm going to do in the next slide. Here is higher education capital across students over time. And again, our, our data are not longitudinal. This is comparing a group of first year students with a group of graduating students. When we compare first year students to graduating students, we find some good news. While the percentage of students at score two stays consistent across college, we find more graduating students that represented by the orange bar are scored as three, and fewer graduating students are scored as one. We still do need to be concerned about the percentage of students that have low head cap score of one, even as they are about to graduate. 10% of students, as you'll see in this slide, who have that is millions of college students in the United States. While we don't find any major differences by students, by students as major, we do find some differences among students at different schools. Some of the schools participating in our study show that students have a lot of head cap growth, while others show a stagnation of head cap, which is alarming and should be concern for the entire sector. At the end of the presentation, in a few minutes, I will address um, this with some recommendations. Interestingly, I don't have the slide in this presentation, but we do score head cap for young alums in our study, those who graduated five to 10 years um, ago. While it's a small group, we find that on the whole, alums score similar, similarly to graduating students. This is good news, bad news. 
On the one hand, it's good news that headcap does not decrease after college. However, the bad news is that it doesn't seem to increase either. This is more evidence of the importance and the once in a lifetime opportunity to increase headcap and develop the mind, something that a first year college doesn't seem to do. And that's what we need to do in college. It's also important for us to take a step back and consider the relationship of these two concepts I've just presented, higher education capital and mental models. What might be some of your predictions about how these two concepts relate? I'm gonna share that now. In a sentence, we find a significant relationship between mental models and head cap. Here, you can see that those students who have a transformational mental model represented by the orange bar are much more likely to score a three on head cap than a one. Conversely, students who have a trans transactional mental model represented by the blue bar on the slide are much more likely to score a one on head cap than a three. Put simply, it matters that students approach college with a transactional mental model. Our data suggests that they might not get as much out of college as those students with a transformational mental model or even exploratory mental models. So now back to the book question, since we did score that as one for head cap. Here on the slide are the top 10, really 11 books recommended by students. The reason why there are 11 and not 10 is because I think one was tied for third or fourth place. These findings and these books surprised us. In general, much like many of our, the other findings that I described today, we find similarities across students across schools in the books that they recommend. Aside from these top titles, which many of you might believe look familiar, there are a few other general headlines to glean from students' book recommendations. First, it's important to let you know that 20% of students in our sample couldn't think of a book. The second important finding is that the largest percentage of students name books that focus on self-help and personal development. These are the books they think that graduating college students should receive. Books that you see here, How to Win Friends and Influence People, Tuesdays with Maury, also How to Become a Straight A Student was a popular book in this category. The second largest category among students who name books were books of literary fiction, books like Catcher in the Rye, Lord of the Flies, Jane Eyre, The Great Gatsby. Some of those are represented here. In fact, we found that students more often seem to name books that are typical of high school reading than of college reading. And so the bottom line, very briefly, very few students demonstrated that college seemed to make a difference in the books they would recommend. While we thought at the beginning of our study that this was a quote unquote fun question, we do find these, these findings to be depressing. And we do take reading seriously. And we do believe that reading is essential to developing head cap. I'll be curious if there's any discussion about this at the end of the presentation in terms of what books you selected to recommend to a graduating senior. So the third question, what are the obstacles that stand in the way of higher learning? We need to know and understand the challenges that get in the way for students if we want them and expect them to make the most of college. So I'm gonna talk about three different kinds of challenges and problems. The first is what the headlines say. The second is what students actually say. And the third is from our analysis, what we say. So first, the headlines. Some of these headlines might not surprise you. We see and hear a lot about finance issues in terms of the cost of college, free speech issues, issues of social media, and most recently around COVID and some student protests. If we were to carry out the study today, we might expect more concern about cancellation of speech, However, that might be at more selective schools than the less selective schools. 
because those selective schools are more often in the news. We expect that we would hear a lot more about diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice issues, and that racial issues might be competing with some of these cancel issues. Still, with these headlines, we expect that we would mostly hear students talk about I versus we, and I'm gonna to get to that in a second. Interestingly, when we ask students in an open-ended questions about the problems that they confront, we don't hear at all about these topics that we hear in the news a lot. Instead, students talked with us about the prevalence of mental health issues among students, although we do hear much more about that nowadays post-COVID, but at the time of our study, mental health issues were not in the news. 20% of students volunteered that they had their own mental health issues, even though we never asked them, but students on every campus and every constituency did talk about the prevalence of mental health issues. Um, and that was a really big issue and really one of the only areas of agreement across all the different constituencies. Students also talk about issues of alienation, not feeling connected to the academic program, their peers or the overall institution. And they talk a lot about social tensions, most often pertaining to issues across race or socioeconomic st status. Students often remark that there are silos or groups of students, those who are alike tend to stay together and it's hard to talk with students who are different. They were asking throughout the interview for help with that. However, we identified another major problem in our data. And this came through text, through analysis of the text and of the words and responses that we saw. This is the problem that students seem to be uniquely focused on themselves and the I, and not the collective community, what we call the we. We see this in terms of the words they use. And we also did a comparison of I words and we words, and we find that students actually use I words 11 times more than they use we words. This also comes up when we talk with them about their own wellness, their stress, and also their goals for college, and in the mental models that we infer. We actually did recently do an analysis of I and we words across other constituencies in our study, and interestingly, while students use I 11 times more than we, as you can see across these 10 schools, we find that young alums use I words even more often than we words, and parents use them also more than students. So again, students and parents and their young alums are similar but in this case, the I line seems to grow as students become young alums and maybe even eventually parents. We find it also troubling that there is so little concern for ethics broadly construed across our study. Because of our own interest in this topic, as Howard said at the very beginning, um, in terms of how we started this study and our interest in ethics, among young individuals. We did ask students to describe ethical dilemmas that they face as a college student, but that question was met with a lot of confusion. Most don't know what the term is, they don't know what ethics are, and they show that they really don't even think about dilemmas on campus. Furthermore, after we asked an open-ended question about problems they confront, we also asked them to rank order five different problems on campus and academic dishonesty is always ranked as the least important problem, but nearly every college student acknowledges that it is rampant on college campus. This is a major disconnect and a concern for higher education and also for society. So how can we improve the college experience for everyone? This gets to our recommendations at the end of the book. We find a tremendous amount of mission confusion on college campuses. Most students and their parents, and perhaps even young alums and trustees, seem unclear about what the mission is of their institution and of higher education. Students think that the purpose of college 
is to get the degree to move on to the job, whereas faculty and administrators view college as a transformational experience. But even faculty and administrators lament how the institution gives mixed messages. The focus for students is on the career center over philosophy departments. The career center has prime physical locations in prime buildings. You hear a lot about study abroad in internships and all about the different kinds of extracurricular activities and private islands and fancy dining halls and residence halls that students can go to. But you have to squint to find anything about the academic mission at any institution. For example, the word cloud in the middle of this slide highlights how there is mission stray. These are the key words in the mission statements of the 10 schools in our study. Institutions often use these words to please those that come, their promises of learning and experiences which focus on leadership, citizenship, innovation, character, creativity, the arts. You'll see all of that in this word cloud. But how does a student possibly make sense of this? How does a student know that he, what he or she should focus on? It might be okay for the entire sector of education to have a range of these goals shown here, but for a single college or university to have all of these things and to promise all of these things to all people, it can't be possible. And there's no way that a student could make sense of this. We believe that institutions need to embody its mission and take the promise of intellectual development and higher education capital seriously. And so, for example, if a school says it's a liberal arts school, they need to deliver on that promise too. So here are our recommendations. We have a few. The first is to develop and model a single mission about the importance of teaching and learning. The second is to clearly communicate this mission with attention to direct and indirect messaging. This can be done in two ways, as you can see here. The first is onboarding and the second is intertwining. So onboarding happens from the day or the moment that students and their parents begin to look at a college or university. When you go to the website or you visit on campus as a potential student, you see messaging. You see what the school wants you to be drawn towards and what they want you to learn about. And that can be helped. That's something that can be made more explicit. If an academic mission is important to a college, it needs to be explicit. The second is intertwining. If there is another mission, whether it be leadership or ethics or the arts or religion, it should be carefully intertwined into the academic experience so that it's not just an extra that students have to decide about what's more important to them. It should be seen as just as important and intertwined in every academic experience that they have on campus. So that's inter onboarding and intertwining. And schools need to clearly communicate the mission through those two concepts of onboarding and intertwining. And then colleges need to sculpt programs and initiatives that relate to these missions to reduce or drop those that don't relate to the mission. Again, we find that on college campuses, students are trying to check lots of boxes and build their resumes and become involved in everything. And not everything is always so important to a college experience. And so institutions, we believe, need to carefully curate the programs that they offer and get rid of ones that do, do not um, focus on the academic mission. So in other words, we feel that we need to focus on the why of higher education, not just the what and the how. With these concepts in mind, at the end of our book, we give specific recommendations to hypothetical colleges based on the problems that we encountered. But in summary, we believe that in order to carry out the promise of higher education, we need students who understand and are prepared for the mission, adults who support and focus this mission, and faculty and administrators who embody it, and parents and trustees who encourage it, and we also need institutions which reflect the mission 
in everything it has to offer, from its people to its buildings. From a student's first visit to the day of graduation, the mission needs to be clear and consistent. So I'm now gonna stop sharing my slides. Oh, you know what, let me, I'm just gonna quickly show this last slide so anybody can take note of our contact information if you want it, an acknowledgement to our senior project advisor, Richard Light. And now I'm gonna stop the share and ask Andy to help with our Q&A. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Wendy. Thank you, Howard, for the setup. Um, there are not a lot of questions in the Q&A right now, I, so I will just begin with the first one. Um, let's see. How can I teach students to be thinkers, to be critical of their thinking when my job is dependent on student assessments of my teaching? I do have an excellent department head who supports me, but I struggle with student evaluations. And this is from a non-tenure college teacher whose annual review is in part based on student evaluations. Wendy, I, I saw that question, so maybe I'll, okay. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. It's a good question, it's a serious question. It's not one to which there is a glib answer. Um, if you follow what Wendy is saying, uh, the more that the school, which would include, of course, this person's department, has an agreement about what the purpose of an education is. And the more it provides um, students and others with evidence that the education is effective, the easier your job will be. Uh, just to be dramatic, if it was a military school, and that was the purpose was to train military, or it's a religious school, and that was the purpose to train people uh, in religion, or to talk about our own comparison school and engineering school, if the goal is to prepare people to engineer, then it's easier, though it's not by any means simple. But to go directly to your own situation, a lot has to do, as you said, with the leadership of your own department. Uh, but what's the nature of the evaluation? If the evaluation is, is a checklist or just good and bad, um, it's going to be very different than if the evaluation takes a look at what have you actually learned and gives students a chance to show what it is that they've learned. Um, and having sat on both sides of the table for decades, um, you need to have a community where there's a judgment about the, the relative advantages of somebody who gets high, high ratings but doesn't stretch the students and somebody whose ratings aren't as high, but there's real evidence that the students are learning and growing. But if you have to handle it yourself, it's extremely difficult. Then, uh, I, um, I, I empathize with you, but part of being an educator nowadays is it's partly a political job. And that means it isn't just what goes on in your class or how your students rank you in a checklist, but it's foregrounding the things that are important and saying you know, to students, what, what are the three most important things that you learned in this class that you didn't know before? How are you gonna use that? That's very different than asking the fact was the professor funny and that they show good movies and that they give me an A. Another question. It sounds like you are advocating against colleges, universities, trying to be all things to all people. This is an important idea, I think, says the questioner. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, I'll say a word here. Of course, schools are in competition with one another um, for students and for tuition. And so the easiest thing to do is to be a shopping mall. Um, and I like to compare a shopping mall, particularly given the audience tonight, to a well-stocked bookstore. In a well-stocked bookstore, you may be in a comfortable place to have some coffee and to chat with people. But basically, you know there that it's about learning about knowledge. And if we could get schools to, as it were, compete on the value added for higher ed capital, that would be a gift for everybody, including the overall society, and not for the football team or how drunk people get in the fraternities or how often they leave campus uh, to go, to go uh, uh, abroad, which is fine, but you don't go to college to go abroad. You go to college to expand your mind and to 
think about a different kind of person you could be with this incredible opportunity. And for most people, an opportunity at an age of life where you can really grow. It's great if people go to college when they're 50 or 60, but it's not the same as being 20. Yeah, Wendy, do you want to well, just one other word. I, I don't think either one of us are against any of the um, great words in the word cloud that I show, things like leadership, the arts, citizenship. I mean, those are all wonderful things. But we do believe that if you do all of that and don't focus on the intellectual development of the mind, then you're actually not prom delivering on your promise of higher education. And so it's not that we disagree with all those things. It's just you can't do it all. Someone asks, what do you think about the idea that we've already trained our students to be transactional by having an incarceral education system? Their experiences in school are all about grades and ranking and hierarchies. We've gotten the students we deserve. I also agree. This is of particular interest to me is also um, in addition to higher education, but how we can fix our high school system so that we're not just preparing students to get into college, but preparing them for college. And in so many ways, I do agree that um, really probably K through 12, but especially high school is, as this questioner um, mentioned, so focused on the grades and building a promising resume that we're, we are training our students to be transactional and we, we can see that by our, our data. Um, so we do make some recommendations at the end of the book for um, high school educators and also K through 12 more, more broadly, and also parents about the messages that they can send and deliver to students at younger ages. Um, just even very simple questions of college counselors or teachers asking students what they want to get out of college and what the purpose of college is and talking about different disciplines and the value of what liberal arts and sciences is. Not necessarily that every student has to go to liberal arts and sciences, but to, um, to talk about what it is and what you can get from that. And also even what about teaching them about higher education cap? That would be a, a wonderful thing to do at a, in a high school level, so. Let me, let me give a, a, a complimentary answer. Um, we ask students to rank what the purpose of college and then we give them a rank order. And one of the four choices is to get a job. And a lot of students say to get a job. So then we have a follow-up question. This is what you can do with a semi-structured protocol. We can say, and what happens if the job disappears after three years? And most students are stunned. It never even dawned on them. But anybody who would, who would bother to listen to us tonight and reads the newspapers knows that the job market is changing radically and all sorts of jobs are disappearing, new ones are appearing, all things, sorts of things are gonna be done by algorithms and AI and deep learning and so on. And so the notion to get a job when that job may not disappear, it's a, it's a 19th century idea, it's not a 21st century idea. But again, if it's all a career center and what's the first job, then basically colleges are undermining the reasons they're there. I mean, with all due respect, if Google or Goldman Sachs just wants to, um, get students who are going to work there, they should set up their own colleges um, and not, uh, you know, not uh, essentially make students go, go to four, go four years to the University of Pennsylvania or Drexel or Villanova and then go there. Um, you, you actually had another idea, Wendy, recently. I don't think you've gone public with it yet. Well, yeah. My idea actually was that a firm like Goldman Sachs should probably recruit students out of high school that have 4.0 averages and they get into some of the most selective schools because basically that's what they do out of college and if they did that at the high school level students would feel secure that they had a job and then they'd be able to make the most of college take classes and actually focus on what we call learning and not earning um, and so you know these are the students that regardless of what classes they take, what major they pick, they're going to be recruited for, for firms like Goldman Sachs. So they might as well do it at a high school and do these students a favor and actually let them have a college education. And of course, the critique of that is we would just balloon further the difference between social classes and demographic groups. So it's a very, it's a very bad idea, but it's a thought experiment. And part of what you do when you have head cap 
somebody who knows HeadCap is higher education capital, um, is you think about all sorts of alternatives. Would the society be better if we admitted 10 year olds uh, to Goldman Sachs because they did well in an IQ test or a, a pre SAT? That would really destroy so much of what I value in the society. A number of questions have come in. Would you also make changes on how colleges are funded? So much of higher education has become about business and making more money. That's hard to answer, I think, ideally, but it, it is very hard. <laughs> it, you know, I understand the problem. Um, I don't know that I have any particular ideas about how to how to change funding. We know that um, state and government funding has declined over the years, which has caused you know some of these problems that we're discussing. I don't know, Howard, if you have a response about particular ideas. Yeah, I think that uh, schools spend a lot of money on bells and whistles because that's what trustees want to give money for. Um, it's well known that 95% of schools lose money on athletic teams, but yet they feel they can't afford to have it. Similarly, there were schools we visited which had wonderful art museums, 90% of the students never went there. Um, and so I think if schools were to strip down um, and demonstrate the value added in terms of higher ed capital, transformational exploratory things, to have schools compete for trustee money on that basis uh, would be much healthier. I think everybody's thinking, and I'm thinking too, well, the society has a lot of values which go against that. I think anybody who's thinking in the 21st century realizes we have a lot of values which aren't very constructive apart from education. Either we can say, well, we've gone down a certain path in the last 30, 40 years, in my case, 50 or 60 years, and we have to keep going down that path, or to be considered this a wake-up call, um, and we say we need to do higher education differently. Here's a point which is relevant. Um, Wendy and I, with Bill Kirby, are editing a book on higher education around the world. Uh, and one of, the mis one of the fallacies of the uh, 20th, 20th century and early 21st century is we have all the answers in this country and we can't learn from other places. And I think that's completely wrong. Um, there isn't a country in the world, for example, anywhere that I know of that spends a significant amount of money on athletics uh, or fraternities. This is a very American thing because maybe it looked good in 1940. We think we can't stop it. So it's time for us to learn from other places. Also, higher ed is free in many other countries. Uh, that's something that would blow everybody's mind. But if you think, well, we spend huge amounts of money on, on for other things, uh, then it doesn't seem so weird. But I want to try to avoid being more political than uh, is warranted for these. But it's really thinking about options. It's bringing higher education capital to bear on higher ed and not assume that because when I went to school in 1960, when Wendy went to school in 1990, that's the way it has to be. Someone asks if the market doesn't want thinkers, why produce them? And I'm, an economist might tell us to make workers. Mm. I didn't get the question, Wendy. Why don't you answer it? And, and yeah. I'll be if, if the market doesn't want thinkers, why produce them is the question. And I guess I would just very simply say, who's going to solve our real world problems, problems of climate change, problems of pandemics, um, problems of international relations. And so I would say that our society is really in trouble if we let students only focus on their own jobs, their own selves, and the I over the we. And that I think in the last formal opportunity that students or young people have to learn, which is college, we need to do as much as we can to increase higher education capital, increase their sensitivity and awareness to um, worldwide problems. I would also add, and uh, something which hasn't come up yet is the, the whole issue of diversity and inclusion and equity, which are, are huge issues in the college campus today. Um, the, the market could decide, as Wendy and I were saying earlier, that we want to only uh, honor people who come from highly resourced families and went to highly resourced um, high schools. Um, and it's not the market doesn't want thinking. Uh, it wants to get people who already were trained in thinking earlier. And if instead you want to uh, you know, broaden access and give more people a chance to uh, 
and make a decent living and make a contribution to society, um, then you can't afford to say we don't want thinking. Um, so again, this requires a kind of a, a macro view, which isn't just economic, it's political and, and sociological. I think anybody who thinks that the neoliberal economic model of uh, the United States and Western Europe has led to a wonderful time for the world, I think we would have a, we could have a long argument about that. We have a couple more questions before we wrap it up this evening. Um, this, I think you answered this in part already. It says, do you have an idea of how we might escape the numbers game and then aiming at enrollment goals and building programs based upon gainful employment has been the way since the GI Bill entered the game? So do you have an idea about how we might escape the numbers game is essentially the question. Wendy, do you know why the numbers game, what's that an abbreviation for? Well, I think it's about competitiveness across schools of, of um, student enrollment and retainment and focused on also graduation rates and where people get jobs and how much salaries they make. That's, okay. my, that's my guess. Um, but again, I, I guess my argument would be higher education capital. And if institutions were not rated on where, how many students, how few students were accepted or how much salary students made when they left, but rather the increase in higher education capital, that might change the numbers game. I mean, we, we don't want to be grandiose about our book, it's just about to be published, but I guess if we could be the uh, uh, bizarre, um, we would want schools to look at the mental models and the higher educational capital and how that changes over time. And then look at what happens 10 or 20 years later, what these individuals are doing. Um, uh, that's a tall order, but uh, it's a political question. Is there the desire and the will? Um, and uh, I think that, again, you know, let me use it. Let me use a, an analogy from K twelve, which is where I've lived. Um, Finland and Singapore um, are the most effective schools in K to twelve by general agreement. Um, if you went fifty years ago, those schools weren't even uh, they weren't even in the game. But in both societies, there was commitment to have a good educational system and to reach as many students as others and to definance it and depoliticize it and to attract people into the profession and make it attractive for them to stay there. And that's why Singapore and Finland are way out, uh, score us even though we're a much wealthier society than, than, than either of those, um, to um, make our American higher ed system the envy of the world for the next 50 years, we would have to do a similar kind of change and any of you who reads the newspaper would know that's true about many of the systems in this country. I mean, I don't think most of the people listening to here tonight are satisfied with everything, whether it's medical or climate change or uh, racial relationships or democracy. This is a big job. America has changed before. Uh, our colleague Bob Putnam believes there can be an upswing, but that's only if a majority of people want to have an upswing, upswing and uh, are willing to work for it. Uh, we're tiny players in this game, but uh, you know, we, we at Project Zero, our research group, are trying to push the envelope and the needle in ways which we think the society uh, would benefit from. And it's not just American society, it's the, it's the planet. There's one last question, and you, you sort of touched on it, but very briefly. Somebody says, isn't the underlying issue about reclaiming education as a public good rather than learning as a privatized commodity. And then they say, COVID-19 has only exacerbated structural inequality in educational institutions, especially for students who are black indigenous or people of color. Now is the time to center equity in process, in the process of teaching and learning. Yeah, I don't think either of us would quarrel with that. Um, on the other hand, um, every institution now has to look itself in the mirror, both because of what's going on in the world, including Ukraine, because also because of the pandemic and also because of world challenges. And every institution has to ask, why is it there? What's it's there for? What's the fundamental 
non plus ultra of the institution. And um, the, that to us, it's, it's developing the mind, it's training the mind, it's growing the mind and it's growing possibilities. And that should be done for as wide a swath of society as possible. Um, where I become a critic of uh, you know, the, the more extreme versions of DEI is when the reason why we have higher education, namely to train the mind, gets, gets tossed to the side. Because then there's no reason to have schools at all. You know, we could just uh, have a, an income division problem where we could randomly house people and randomly put them in jobs. But in the end, nobody would like that kind of society. So there've been some reasonable trends in America over the last 50, 60 years. That's the message of Putnam's book, The Upswing, but we have a hell of a lot way to go. And you know, Wendy and I wouldn't be involved in educational research for all of our adult lives. And, when just got three kids in college and I've got five grandchildren headed for college, uh, if we didn't really want to want, want the best for them and for, and for our for our nation and for the world. This this last comment question brings us full circle and then we'll wrap it up. Somebody says, have you had responses from student readers of your research? And how do you get this information to students? Yeah. Well we hope we hope the book will we'll get to students. We have to find ways to get the book to students. Um, but we actually have had a couple, few, several interactions with college students. Um, one on the Amherst campus actually, who was looking for advice because he wanted to quote unquote, pressure his administration to focus in our terms on the transformational mental model and not the transactional mental model. Um, and another student also um, an undergraduate at Harvard College um, who was disappointed by the experience of meeting so many other students who are focused on transactions. So we do, we do um, hear from college students and we do in these, both of these cases, we uh, have worked with them and sent them some materials and some articles and given advice. Um, and we hope to do more of that in the future. And we hope our book will reach um, K through 12 educators, parents and students. I think it's a great question because uh, the best way to bring about bring up bring um, change about in campus is to motivate students who care to uh, demonstrate their care and uh, to broadcast it. And uh, even though we're just two people with a small research group, as Wendy just indicated, when people come to us and say we'd like to achieve something which we feel we can be helpful to, we we will we will we will try to do that. Well, I think it's been a very helpful conversation tonight. Thank you, Wendy Fishman. Thank you, Howard Gardner, for your research and your writing and for this book. And people can look for it in stores next week. There's a link in the chat. If people want to click on that, they'll be able to buy a book um, now and we'll ship it to you in two to three weeks. Again, thank you for this evening. We appreciate your time. Thanks for coming to Philadelphia and coming back home, as it were. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.